Our last segment we have entitled Updates from Around the State. So we have enlisted some experts uh, in the state of Arkansas that we would like to come and ask to come and share with, uh, with you guys about some of the things that they're doing and how we can move forward in the state of Arkansas. Um, our first speaker is going to be Trina Mitchell. Trina is Executive Director of the Arkansas Cancer Coalition. Within public health, Ms. Mitchell has expanded her knowledge and skills in data management, program evaluation, and community philanthropy. And what I thought was the most important thing about Trina when I read her bio was that she is an alumni of the University of Arkansas at Pine Bluff, and she also holds a master's degree in marketing. Our next speaker will be Ms. Joy Gray. Joy currently is branch chief for the Arkansas Department of Health Tobacco Prevention and Cessation Program. And she is one of the creators of the Be Well Arkansas Program. And you're going to hear a little bit more about that from her. Then we have Mrs. Sharonda Love. Sharonda currently is director of the Arkansas Minority Health Commission. She received her undergrad and graduate degrees from UALR and UAMS, Faye W. Bozeman School, College of Public Health, respectively. And she has extensive experience in chronic disease and health behavior, health education. Again, these are our panelists for today, and we will begin with Ms. Trina Mitchell. Thank you. Can you all see my hair? <laughs> <laughs> so thanks so much for allowing me to be here with you all uh, this afternoon. I may have to leave early uh, so we can get back to Little Rock by 3 p.m., so I'll do my best to stay on time. Uh, next slide, please. Just to give you an idea of what the Arkansas Cancer Coalition, our mission is to uh, provide for facilitate partnerships to reduce the burden of cancer in Arkansas. We do have a board of directors of 15 uh, board members that advise and ensure that we are in compliance here uh, with the Arkansas Cancer Coalition. And newly appointed to the board is, is Marion, so we're great, awesome, uh, it's awesome to have her on board. So these are um, the members of our current board of directors. Uh, next slide. We also operate uh, with uh, a, seven, a small staff of seven, uh, which is actually huge considering uh, most coalitions do not have much staff at all. So as you can see, it's a lot of woman power on this slide. <laughs> and uh, we have, uh, I, I tell everyone that over coffee, we've, um, say we've solved all the world's problems and our next thing is to take down tobacco companies. So we should have a solution for you soon. <laughs> <laughs> Next slide, please. Um, how we uh, fall into the funding with the Arkansas Department of Health, back in 2008, the General Assembly um, allowed $1.8 million for, to implement the Arkansas Cancer Plan, and I'll explain a little bit that, uh, to you in the next slide. So um, there are five uh, organizations that receive that funding, with coalition, the coalition being one, and then we also have a grant program with competitive grants and media grants, also like Ms. Argo to uh, provide funding to advance the goals of the Arkansas Cancer Plan. Next slide, please. So just to give you an uh, idea, I can't see. Okay, here we go. I'm like kind of contorted here. So just to give you an idea of what a cancer coalition is and how we function here in the United States, here in Arkansas, uh, all 50 states have some type of cancer coalition. It's called a consortium. Um, just they, it's all kinds of names. Uh, but the CDC provides funding to the Arkansas Department of Health, the other departments of health and universities uh, to provide funding for cancer coalitions to do community work, working with leaders, experts, and advocates so we can decrease the burden of cancer in our particular state. Next slide. And so we are responsible for implementing the Arkansas Cancer Plan. These are the uh, first, second, and third cancer plan. We've got one uh, in revision, uh, or actually we'll be uh, starting our fourth uh, annual cancer plan um, implementation for uh, 2021. But uh, next slide, please. And but this is the purpose of the cancer plan. I won't read to you, as you can see. It provides strategies and, and uh, objectives for us to continue to um, provide activities to reduce the burden of cancer all across the spectrum for all cancers that uh, the coalition has uh, focused on. Next slide. And so, uh, in the tobacco world, 
I say tobacco wool because cancer is, you have cancer, you've got lung, breast, colorectal, prostate, and all the other cancers, but then we have to take a moment to actually deal with tobacco prevention and cessation. And so one of the things that we do is we provide trainings for healthcare providers to identify uh, tobacco users and how to treat them and what to do once you uh, or you're talking to a person that has that has a, has cancer because as you know if you're going through cancer treatments and you use uh, tobacco products it weakens your the, the resistance of the medication and it's, it's almost like why uh, why go through a treatment if you're going to smoke so and some of the healthcare providers we found that um, the older class of physicians are not so focused on tobacco users um, because when they went to medical school, it wasn't an issue then. So now we find that the younger group of physicians are more, um, are, they're taking on the approach to dealing with tobacco patients and they also are in that culture with the new types of cigarettes that are coming out. So they're a little bit more, um, I guess, they're willing to provide some of the, the, uh, the trainings that we do receive. But we're still working with all physicians and healthcare providers across the spectrum. Next slide. So um, this year, well last year, this uh, tobacco symposium is held in November of each year. And so um, November 16th, we work with UAMS to provide this training for nurses, pharmacists, occupational therapists, and uh, physicians to talk about some of the, the issues in tobacco control. And, uh, in tobacco control. Next slide. And some of the, here are some of our topics. Again, I don't want to read to you because I thought you can see with vaping and screening and diagnosis, little CT scans, assessment and interventions. And so it was pretty well received. Uh, we underestimate our healthcare providers thinking that they know everything when actually they do not. So it is our job to educate them, like we do our legislators, legislators on some of the topics of, for tobacco control. Uh, next slide. And so this year we uh, trained 20 healthcare professionals and provided some CMEs and CEUs so that uh, it's a more attractive uh, um, um, training for physicians to come. And so we hope to continue to expand. In the past we have trained more, but as we're having to revamp and uh, reevaluate some of the content, it gets a little harder and harder to get into these positions. So anytime we can train one, I think we've done an excellent job. Next slide. And so uh, with our uh, grant program, here's one of our success stories. We work with the, uh, a doctor, a physician, um, not a physician, nurse, uh, Dr. Claudia Barone, who took a small grant of about $45,000 and with her clinic, she was able to create a systems approach to identify tobacco users who are currently being treated for cancer and to get them to quit smoking. Now, that had never been done in Arkansas, from my understanding at the time. And so with that funding, she was able to take just a small amount of money, take her staff, and just reroute how the patients are coming into the office. From there, counseling them on cessation services so that when they're in treatment, they no longer are using tobacco. Um, next slide. From there, um, again, 48 patients were served. Uh, at that time, two had consented to full services, and we had uh, and we were using the quit line at that time, and 46 were, were um, sent to the quit line. But from there, she was able to, next slide, talk about some of the work from this grant and have a publication available for other nurses to use uh, for their, clinic, their clinics. Next slide. So another approach we took was motivational interviewing. We worked with Dr. Joseph Bacon with a couple of uh, clinics to uh, assess the readiness of a patient. And so we had some pretty good success over the past two years working with Dr. Bacon to really uh, train healthcare providers on how to identify a tobacco patient and then what to do once you're in their presence. So that has been very, uh, very well received training and we hope that we can, can continue with this training. Next slide. And we also work with daycares. So this year we got Grandma's House, which is in Little Rock, um, off of John Barrow, who was able to go totally smoke free um, at her daycare. So it's just small things of going and talking to a person and just explaining how it affects you know, their clientele. And sometimes they're just so willing to say yes. And so we were able to uh, get this policy signed before the uh, the act, <laughs> the preemption act. So, so we squeezed it in right at the uh, at the last minute. 
uh, next slide. And so we also work with our traditional partners. Next slide. We love to work with uh, different festivals, anywhere where we can reach yep, the unreachable. So uh, if you are familiar with Conway, Arkansas, they have Tulsa Days. This is our first year working with them. We created a policy, a tobacco policy for them. Uh, and, and we were the official safety zone. This is again right before preemption law. But we uh, were able to uh, have a signed tobacco policy, the bakery policy at Tulsa, which has never been done before. Uh, next slide. Same thing with the state fair. Uh, we're working with them to be comprehensive, but for the most part, we do have quite a few zones at the state fair that are tobacco free. Um, I always tell a story about with Miriam, um, cattle, talking about cattle and livestock and how expensive it is. And they ear, the ears just, I mean, the eyes like, you know, we gotta do something about it. And from there, create a tobacco law, a tobacco policy at the Arkansas State Fair. Uh, next slide. And so this is just some of our outcomes from working with the Tobacco State Fair, the Livestock Association. Uh, we've had 22 mammograms, uh, 39 oral health screenings, we collect surveys, uh, CO monitoring, and so we hope to continue with this partnership to eventually have a comprehensive uh, policy fitting the preemption situation. <laughs> and last, I think it's the last slide. Um, we, yeah, this is just some of the work that we've done, some pictures of the tobacco-free signs, and then some of the work we did at the Arkansas State Fair. And so, uh, the last slide is, I believe, is my information. If you want to join, uh, become a member of the Arkansas Cancer Coalition, feel free to give me a call or go to our website, and we'll be glad to have you. Thank you. All right, so I'm going to be short and sweet because that's usually how I like for presentations to me when I'm in the audience. So, <laughs> so I am Joy Gray, and I'm the oh there we go yeah okay. So I'm the brain chief for the Tobacco Prevention and Cessation Program, where you'll hear us say TPCP all the time. So now you know what TPCP stands for because people throw the acronyms around a lot and don't actually ever explain what they are. So now you know. And I'm glad to be here today. And as many of you know, TPCP has recently undergone some pretty big changes. And I'm going to kind of highlight some of those changes today, talk about what we're doing, how we're working on tobacco decreasing in the state of Arkansas, and kind of how we're starting to branch into overall wellness as part of our cessation. So next slide, please. So this is just an easy little graphic that I made to sort of highlight everything that we do in TPCP fits into one of these five things, pretty much. You can stick anything in there that we're doing right now. So I'm gonna go over each little point quickly, and I'll probably say this a lot, but my last slide is my information. It's my phone number, it's my email. If you want any information from us, if you want presentations, if you want to come to a training that we're doing, do not hesitate to contact me. That is part of what we're here for, is to provide these things to you. So next slide, please. All right, so education. So this is just a few of the things that we're focusing on right now with education. We have trained since November, this last November, we've trained 136 people to be tobacco treatment specialists in Arkansas. So that's huge. That's more people probably than have ever been trained in the state of Arkansas. And that's another one where if you feel like being a tobacco treatment specialist would enhance your job, that it's something that you could use in your field, email me or call me and we will get you on the list. We have a training in November and another one in March. So be on the lookout for that. Call me, email me. We'll get you into that class. And we also, in the spring, we just provided a community toolbox training. And that was from the University of Kansas. We brought in some of their staff to come in and work on training about sustainability and coalition building. We also use our HHI branch to go out to the field, some of the chips and chins, and other people that work for ADH that we have internal partnerships with, go into the community, do presentations anywhere on everything. Especially right now, Jewel, of course, is the big thing. We have Jewel presentations for just about every age group. And we also have them, we are now converting them into Spanish, and we have presenters who can come to the community and do the presentations in Spanish as well. So if you need it in English, you need it in Spanish, and whatever age group you need it for, we got it. So again, call me, email me, I will get you that presentation. And UCA actually is one of the first universities that's called us because their athletes are dueling at an unhealthy rate, and it is causing a decrease in the productivity of the athletes. So now they're calling us and saying, hey, come help us because you know, if you can't breathe, you can't run right. faster, you can't jump higher, you can't, you know, block somebody on the field if you can barely breathe. So, that is something that we're looking, I figure this next school year we'll probably have even more people start calling us and wanting to get their athletes back in a better condition. Next slide, please. 
So these are just some of the partnerships. We can't do this by ourselves. We only have a staff of like 19 people, and they are all busy all day, every day. And we cannot go to every school, we cannot go to every university, we cannot go to every church. And that's why we have y'all as partners, and we value, y'all, value our work with you very, very much. And so we're glad to have these partnerships, and we're always looking for more. So if you have a group that you think we can pair with, again, call me, email me. It's the last slide of the presentation. <laughs> and we will find a way to work together, because our partnerships... Like, for example, with ACC, that's a huge, valuable partnership for us. We get a lot of work done through them, and so hopefully there's some other groups out there that we can start working with as well. And next slide, please. So you've probably seen the commercials that have this. This is still shots from the commercials that we've converted into print ads. You've probably also seen these print ads. And I will be honest, the first time I saw our commercial for Be Well, I thought, that looks so good, it doesn't even look like a health department commercial. <laughs> <laughs> and then I said that to our communications team and they were very offended. But I don't care, I stand by it. It looks so good, it doesn't look like a health department commercial. <laughs> and that's what people keep telling me, they're like, I saw that commercial, I didn't even realize it was from a government agency. And so that's on purpose. We did that on purpose because a lot of our focus groups have said that people are kind of tired of some of the negative messaging that they're getting with public health stuff and they're ready to hear a positive message. And so what we decided to do when we created Be Well Arkansas, which as many of you know took over for the former Arkansas Tobacco Quit Line, we decided we were going to roll other elements of wellness into it, diabetes prevention and hypertension prevention, and we're going to focus on all the things that you can be when you are well and when you stop smoking and when you control your diabetes and so on. So these are from the first set of commercials that we did. And we actually just filmed a brand new set of commercials here in Pine Bluff. So be on the lookout for those probably in June, roundabout. So there's going to be a 15, minute, 15 second ad and a 30 second ad, and then there'll be some still shots coming from that as well. Another thing that we can offer is posters of these sorts of things. If you want poster cards, materials, one more time, last slide of the presentation is my information. Call me, email me, I will get them to you. So, all right. Next slide, please. And so this is prevention. Obviously, preventing youth initiation, we know that's one of the big goals. It's always going to be one of the big goals. And the way we do that right now is primarily through sub-grantee technical assistance and the big push for e-cig education. We have 11 community sub-grantees all over the state. They're similar to the Miss Argo sub-grantees in the way that they function. And between them and our staff, we have gotten over 2,000 Arkansas students have already seen the dual presentation. So the next school year, we look to do several thousand more, we hope. Please go, oh, wait, no, one more. There you go, okay. Um, and we've collected about 1,200 surveys from them. So we've really started an emphasis on not just going out and educating, but also surveying, because these kids are teaching us more than we ever could learn in any other way. They don't understand the clinical dangers of what they're doing, but they have been teaching us. One thing that we've recently learned is the renting of the jewel, where you know, little Johnny, he's very, you know, he's got an entrepreneurial spirit. He buys a few jewels, he takes them to school, and he rents it to you for an hour, and then you for an hour, and then you for an hour. And y'all know he ain't washing it in between. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hence the flu outbreak we just got done with. So, that was something that we learned from kids, and now we're telling the parents about it. We were all horrified because, you know, as public health workers, you just get progressively more and more germophobic. And so... <laughs> It's just a constant, uh, you know, hand sanitizer. I'm so happy to see hand sanitizer in the bag today. It made me so excited. I was digging for it, looking for it. I was so excited because that's how we are as health workers. But these kids are not that way. They are not sanitizing the jewel before it goes from one kid to the next. So it's just a little stick of disease at that point. So that's another thing that we've learned through our surveys and talking to kids. So, and also, I'm sure you're all familiar with Laura's not here today, but PPYC, the Project for Big Youth Coalition. Right now they've got 54 chapters in 40 counties around the state and we're always looking to help you know expand those numbers and get more information those kids do a lot of really good work and that's where a lot of this stuff happens is with those kids at that grassroots level next slide please all right so cessation again be well arkansas we started that november 5th is when it launched we took over the arkansas tobacco quit line so if you call 1-800 quit now it goes to us and we also added the 1-833-283 well and you can call for your, if you want to quit smoking, you have diabetes, you have hypertension, you have all three, give us a call and we will help you with that. And again, 
part of our tobacco treatment specialist training, in addition to training our staff and community partners, we've trained, at this point, I think we have, how many, 97 of those that we train were community health nurses at the local health units. So we are rolling cessation into the local health unit. So those people who go to ADH local health unit to treat their other illnesses, they can get tobacco cessation on site. That nurse knows how to do the cessation, she knows how to do the counseling, she has nicotine replacement patches, so on and so forth. So we know that that it's great to have a line for people to call, but it's also great for, for them to have something right there in their community to walk into. So that's something that we're really excited about. And right now we have the ability, you can get it in any county, but we're gonna keep training more nurses. Obviously, you know, people retire, things like that. But we really also wanna train a lot of community members that are doing cessation as well. So again, get in touch with me. The other thing we're working on is cessation in groups that have big disparities. Our next project right now, in addition to, obviously, we work with Misargo. We're expanding into doing all of our presentations in Spanish as well. And then another thing we're working on is pregnant smokers. Mm -hmm. We have a project that's going to be upcoming at the end of the summer, beginning of the fall, where we're going to incentivize quitting for pregnant smokers because women who are smoking, they are going to be a disparate population one way or another. So we're looking at targeting them, getting some really good programs together for them. And let's see, next slide. All right, so looking ahead. So what do we want to do? Obviously, everybody here wants people to stop smoking. We've got to get ahead of the EC problem. You know, like she was saying today, there's literally new stuff every time we come to work or I visit a gas station to pump gas, I see a new product that's being advertised because we all Google search mm -hmm. things to do with tobacco and nicotine. It populates the ads. Every ad I get in my Yahoo mail is, you know, bigger pods, more nicotine. Mm -hmm. So we're constantly getting this information. So we want to try to get ahead of these issues. That's one thing that we want to do as we look ahead. And we're always looking for new partners, new people to pair up with, new places to do these presentations. So again, if you have something that you think would benefit, if you have a group, coalition, organization, church, we can do these presentations for you. We can get you, you know, posters, cards, whatever you want. That's what we're here to do is to be a resource for y'all. And, you know, lastly, we just want to make sure that everyone in Arkansas knows there is help when you're ready to quit. If you're ready, call us. We can help you. We can help you do this. We can all work together and make this happen. And so we've had a lot of positive changes and we're looking forward to even more in the future. And next slide, please. Again, here's my information. Call me, email me. I can get with you at any time and we can work on whatever it is that y'all need to help your programs and help us work together. Thank you. Good afternoon. Again, I am Sharonda Love, Director for the Arkansas Minority Health Commission. And since Joy was so quick and I'm the last one, that means I've got to be even quicker. <laughs> So my goal for today is to um, increase the awareness of minority health um, disparities in Arkansas, as well as provide details about the Arkansas Minority Health Commission programs and to offer some avenues for collaboration and coordination of minority health in Arkansas. So I guess I need next slide, um, two slides to our mission which is to ensure all minority Arkansans equitable access to preventive health care and to seek ways to promote health and prevent diseases and conditions that are prevalent among minority populations. In essence, we um, provide access to preventive health screenings and health education. Next slide, please. I always like to recognize our prior directors. As you can see, I stand on the shoulders of some giants, not only in Arkansas history, but in US history. And so I always like to give due respect where it's due. Next slide. This is the Arkansas Minority Health Commission staff. We are small in number, but as I go through our presentation today, I am sure you will see the large impact that we have for our state. Next slide. So our legislation defines minority as African American, Hispanic American, Native American, American Indian, um, Asian American, and we also include the Marshall Lease population that's within the northwest uh, portion of our state. Next slide, please. So the layers and many, many layers of minority health. To quote Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., 
of all forms of inequality, injustice in health care is the most shocking and most inhumane. Like most health topics, minority health has many layers that contribute to the disparities that we see today, and I like to describe those disparities like peeling the layers of an onion because they are many. Minority health is the ability to communicate with the skills of a lay person and a professional. It is having the knowledge of health topics. It impacts culture. It is rooted in tradition. It is the demands of the health care and the public health systems. And it is the ability to navigate the health care system, including filling out forms, locating providers, and services. It is the ability to share personal information, including your health history. And it is engaging in self-care and chronic disease management, as well as understanding the probability of disease. Who understood that? <laughs> no one. And that's because we are used to talking in jargon and big language that people don't normally understand. So in plain language, Minority Arkansans have to be able to understand health and what impacts their health in order to access health care and utilize it for their benefit. And that's what's important. We can get to the doctor, but if we, when we go there, it doesn't benefit us. It doesn't necessarily help us. And so as minorities, we have to start taking ownership and challenging the norm. So one quick story that I like to give about challenging the norm is the ham story. Who's heard the ham story? Okay, there's a couple of y'all that don't hear it again. <laughs> so the young lady comes home from college and she's cooking for Thanksgiving dinner with her mom and mom starts to prepare the ham. She cuts the end of the ham off. And so she asks mom, because she's in college, she's now used to asking questions. Why did you cut the end of the ham off? And mom said, well, that's because what my mama did. And so she then says, okay, grandma, mama cuts the end of the ham off. Why did we cut the end of the ham off? And what do y'all think grandma said? That's because what my mama did. Mm -hmm. So luckily, great grandma still living. She gets on the phone, she calls great grandma. Why did we cut the end of the ham off? What did great grandma say? <laughs> grandma said, yeah, I know why we did it. I didn't have a pot big enough, so I had to cut the end of the ham off to make it fit. And so all these years, they have been doing the same thing without really understanding why it is we're doing that. And sometimes we go into the doctor and we sit there, we listen to them, get all that jargon like I just did to you guys a minute ago and no one thought to say, stop, what are you talking about? Mm -hmm. No one thought to say, I didn't understand what that meant. And that's what we've got to get in the habit of doing, questioning the norms. Right. So if a child grows up in a house and never sees anyone exercise, guess what? They will never exercise. Mm -hmm. And just the same, if a child grows up in the house and sees people smoking, they will what? Smoke. Which will then impact their health later. So we have to start challenging the norm and understanding all the layers of minority health disparities and how that impacts us later in life. Next slide, please. So minority health determines the health of our nation and our state. According to the CDC, residents in mostly minority communities continue to have lower socioeconomic status, greater burden of disease, and less or greater risk for disease than the, the, the population living in the same state or county. Depending on the area of Arkansas that you live in, whether you live in Northwest Arkansas or Central Arkansas, your life expectancy will be greater or longer than those living in our Delta counties. And so while our zip code should not matter, it does. So some health concerns that impact minority adults 
include economic indicators like poverty, education, access at every level, food, insurance, and health care, as well as health literacy. Also, health indicators like diabetes, stroke, heart disease, HIV, maternal and infant mortality. Next slide, please. Also, the Working Families uh, Policy Brief of 2014-15 reported that three out of five children in low-income working families are racial and ethnic minorities. And while racial and ethnic minorities make up only 40% of all working families in the United States, they accounted for 58% of low-income working families. And as noted here on this slide, these are the fastest growing families within the U.S. So child health disparities are not as well developed and researched as adult disparities, but inevitably, whatever impacts the parents will impact the child. And so some gaps in minority children's health include health care quality, health care workforce diversity, and coordination and monitoring to reduce health care disparities. Next slide, please. So some of our overarching goals for the Arkansas Minority Health Commission is to increase screenings for the number of minority Arkansans um, with diseases here in, in Arkansas, as well as increasing the number of minority Arkansans who receive education regarding these diseases. Um, our next goal helps us to navigate the, um, the system here within our state to find healthcare resources, like using the UAMS FAC system, which is a database that helps you to locate resources at the county level, whether it's free resources, sliding fee scale, clinics, pharmacies, dentists, mental health. Um, it's a, a, a resource that's available to everyone within the state. Um, and as previously pointed out, the Arkansas Minority Health Commission is very small in number. So we depend a lot on our collaboration and network for our stakeholders to have outreach within our communities here within Arkansas. Next slide, please. We also have a strong network of coordination and collaboration with other agencies and organizations. When I came to the Arkansas Minority Health Commission, we were partnering with approximately 50 um, organizations in just as many counties. We are now partnering with 92 organizations in 62 counties. And a little bit later, I'll tell you about how you can partner with the Arkansas Minority Health Commission. And we are working at every level with individuals, organizations, schools, communities, um, and nonprofits that are committed to the mission and vision of the Arkansas Minority Health Commission. And finally, we advocate for policy that will promote the health of minority Arkansans within our state. Next slide, please. So, our sponsorships and partnerships. The Arkansas Minority Health Commission collaborates with community-based, faith-based organizations and others to address health problems that affect minority Arkansans by providing funding. We have sponsorship opportunities multiple times throughout the year. We uh, fund activities from January through June, July through December, April for Minority Health Month, and year-round for tobacco initiatives. And through our partnerships, we're able to provide um, this last fiscal year over 29,000 preventive health screenings and 33,000 health education encounters. Um, and while we target minority populations, our services are available to anyone within our state. Next slide, please. So these are some photos of some of our um, sponsorship partnerships that we've had. Um, this past year, and our sponsorships are available for up to $5,000. The application is available on our website along with our sponsorship policy. Um, and some examples of activities that we've received sponsorships for include back to school fairs, um, for immunizations and physicals, as well as activities for tobacco, nutrition, fitness education, as well as any health initiative within your community. Next slide, please. So here are some of our traditional programs that we have at the Arkansas Minority Health Commission. One is called our Southern Ain't Fried Sundays program. I'm sure everybody's heard of that one. 
and it is a 21 day healthy meal toolkit that encourages individuals to not do what we like to do here in the South, and that is to fry everything. And so it has some traditional Southern foods that are um, that have recipes to um, cook it in a healthier way that is lower in fat and lower in sodium. We also have our camp initiative, previously known as Camp IROC, that focused on adolescent girls to provide nutrition, fitness, and self-esteem curriculum. This summer, we will be implementing a um, new camp called Camp I Can in um, Helena, West Helena, in partnership with uh, Cooperative Extension as well as UAMS East, and it will include boys and girls to focus on nutrition, physical activity, and bullying um, within schools. Next slide. So, you're probably saying, well, how do I know about all this information? How can I get on with what you're doing? If you are not currently, you should um, join our listserv. You can do so by logging on to our website at arminorityhealth.com and um, request to be added to the listserv. And then you can also follow us on social media, which is our next slide. Um, to get regular updates. We not only um, post updates about our activities and programs, but we have monthly health campaigns that focuses on things like Minority Health Month for April or Breast Awareness um, in October. Next slide, please. We also host community forums quarterly where we travel to different areas throughout the state and we work with a local physician to provide health statistics that are specific to the county that we are in. Um, and it's an opportunity for community members to come out and get their specific health questions answered. Um, and it's usually well received because we provide a healthy meal, um, but also because it is in a comfortable setting, usually somewhere within the community, and individuals are encouraged to bring their families and friends so they feel comfortable with asking a doctor the questions that they may have about their health. Next slide, please. We also host an annual um, summit every other year. One year it is a national focus where we um, focus on topics that are national minority health topics and it is a day-long summit where we have breakout sessions and keynote speakers. Uh, 2018, we had U.S. Surgeon General Dr. Jerome Adams as well as former uh, Surgeon General Dr. Joyce Lynn Elders. This um, current year, 2019, we had our State of Minority Health, which is a panel discussion and it usually focuses on state minority health issues. And this year, it was uh, in April, and we focused on our um, Arkansas Racial and Ethnic Health Disparities Survey that um, is a follow-up from our 2009 survey that polled um, minorities and the majority population within our state, either in rural or um, urban counties, and asked their um, um, questions as it related to health and um, what their perceptions were and what we found was that of course they were completely different um, and whereas you know minorities seem to um, experience racism when they have seen doctors or felt that they were not able to see doctors that were of their specific race on a regular basis the majority population did not have the, the same experience and perception Um, next slide, please. I also brought copies of our annual Bridge Magazine. Um, there are copies here on the table, so if anyone would like to um, take one, they're, they're there. And if we run out and there's not enough, you can contact our office and we will send you one. And so this publication is statewide. And um, if this year's focus is healthcare workforce diversity, and um, it features Dr. Lanita White and the UAMS 12th Street Clinic, 
as well as Philander Smith's Elder School of Allied and Public Health, the New Osteopathic School of Medicine in Jonesboro, Alzheimer's, um, Infant Mortality, ACEs, and Suicide. So please pick one up and learn um, more about the Arkansas Minority Health Commission and what others are doing to impact minority health in our state. Next slide, please. And so, this is something that I am actually very proud of. It is our new mobile health unit. Um, so like I said, when I came to the Arkansas Minority Health Commission, we were in 50 out of our 75 counties, but we are a state agency. And so my goal was to see us be statewide and reach all corners of our state. Um, so to do that, we uh, worked with the governor's office and got funding to purchase a new mobile health unit, which is a 38-foot RV that's customized with two exam rooms, a health education station, and um, it is ADA accessible, so wheelchairs can come on board. Um, we will be providing preventive health screenings, including BMI, blood pressure, cholesterol, glucose, HIV, and soon oral health screenings. And it is our goal to meet people where they are, driving into communities of need, providing access to free preventive screenings to communities. Next slide, please. And so um, we are very appreciative of the governor and his support in purchasing the mobile unit. Um, we are already booking about three months in advance. We are about mid-September now. Um, and so if you are interested in having the mobile health unit in your community, we want to be there. Um, but I do recommend that you go ahead and contact our mobile health coordinator, Beatrice Mundragon, so that she can get you on the schedule um, and we can be in your community. So at this time, I think we will do questions. The next slide, I think, is my contact information. If anyone has any questions, um, feel free to contact me and I will be happy to answer those. Thank you, Lady, for a wealth of knowledge from these three uh, young women. Uh, are there any questions from the audience? Hi, so I have a question actually following up to your mobile health, your preventive services, your outreach. Mm -hmm. So when you find, if you find something within the population, do you have like a navigation system that's navigating them through the so, yes, can y'all hear me? I can't figure this out, sorry. <laughs> yes. yes, we do. So the, the good thing about the mobile health unit is that's different from normal health fairs. We don't collect um, any demographic data at health fairs. People walk in, they get the information, they walk out. But the mobile health unit, we will be collecting that demographic data and able to follow up at three, six, and 12 months for anyone who has um, an abnormal screening. And we will... So you're following up to look at outcomes associated with your intervention, the preventive screening? But I meant na navigating that. So. so we will be using the UAMS FACT system that I mentioned previously that provides access to resources at the county level to make referrals for any abnormal screenings and then we follow up at three to six months to inquire as to whether they follow through with that referral and then if not, see if we are able to um, figure out what those barriers were and, and address those barriers. Do we have any more questions? I have a question for both of you knowledgeable ladies. Uh, going forward, uh, what is the number one challenge uh, that you feel your organization faces in working to address the rising use of tobacco and more tobacco products in the state of Arkansas? I think from just my perspective, I think part of it is it's so hard to get in front of the new products and the emerging products. They just happen so fast sometimes. I feel like right as we get a really good presentation and it's crafted really well, then we have to stop and add in three more slides because we just discovered a new product. I think also people sort of feel like with clean indoor air, which was great, you can't smoke, you know. Like at one point, people would have been sitting in this thing smoking, you know. People, I remember being a kid and people just, you know, walking around the Piggly Wiggly smoking like it was nothing. And because we don't do that now, people think, well, we fix smoking. 
oh, well, we've handled tobacco and we haven't. We've just made it where you're not smoking out in public as much anymore. So I think sometimes the attitude of, well, we've done that. Well, we're not done. We're not done at all. And now in addition to not being done with just combustible cigarettes, we have this huge issue of all these new emerging products that is just a monster to get in front of. And I think for us is capacity. We are very small in number and we were an agency of only eight and only two of those are programmatic. And so we can only be so many places at one time. Um, and so it's just being able to be everywhere at one time and figuring out how best to address everybody's needs. And my last question. Sorry. <laughs> what do you feel will be your next steps? And I know that you may have elaborated a little bit on this when you were uh, in the middle of your presentation, but what do you think are your next steps in educating the citizens of Arkansas? I think for us, we've already kind of been strategizing about, we're, we're really working and focusing on educating the children at the clinical dangers. And then also we just, Sheila and I, my associate director, we're talking today about we really need to get into these PTAs, we really need to get into these school districts or school boards, because in these small communities, which I grew up in a very small community, the school is the center of the universe. You know, everything happens at the school, everybody important works at the school, everything important happens at the school. And so I think for us, our, one of our next big steps is not just gonna be educating the kids, but getting on board with those parents and those school officials, because that's, well, that's where we're probably going to cut the legs off this as much as possible for us. So I think for us, that's another huge step that we're gonna make. And then the next big step is gonna be, we need to partner with all these schools. We need to partner with these people in these communities, You know, figure out what groups are down there in those communities that wanna work with us to get on board to really get against this thing. So I think for us, that's kind of our next, one of our next big things we've got going. And, and I just have to agree with that, growing our partnerships. We've already doubled our partnerships in, in just a little over two years, and I would like to see us continue to grow those numbers because the more we're able to partner at the community level, the more we're able to get information out, and all of our partners are required to, um, to deliver information as it relates to tobacco prevention. So please join me in giving these young ladies a round of applause. I want to encourage you to please pick up one of the Bridge uh, magazines. I was commending uh, Mrs. Love on that publication because I remember a couple of years ago when it was just a little small kind of pamphlet like, but it has grown into a very large magazine. So please pick up a copy, they're free of charge, and they're right over here to my left on this table. Uh, with that being said, thank you ladies. <laughs> we just have a few closing remarks. First of which is um, someone left their keys in the women's restroom. Um, you get to your car and <laughs> come see me. <laughs> okay, just a few people and I hope I don't overlook anyone. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank the planning committee. I think most of them are out in the hallway, but if you are here and you're part of the planning committee or you have something to do on the program today, please stand. We just want to show you some appreciation. Ruth, did that mean you? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you all so much for your participation today. I'd like to thank, and since you're here, I thank you earlier this morning. We'd like to thank the Minority Health Commission because, you know, as you talk about the sponsorships, so they were our sponsor for today, and we thank them so much for providing uh, the money for us to do the outreach. So, also, it's, that's why we can tell you to go get your health screenings. <laughs> um, I'd like to thank Dwight Nelson, Tariq Barone, Randy Kelly, Keith Franklin, and Joe Brown. Um, this was our makeshift technical uh, team today. Um, all of these men came to help uh, today to just do whatever that, that needed to be done with, um, to help us get through this event today, and I really, really appreciate it. Um, we would also like to say a special thank you to uh, Aramark, um, the UAPB TV and any and the private donors that we had for your snacks that were on your table. And the last thing I would say, there are CEUs available at the desk where you registered, and please leave your evaluation forms on the table. And we hope to see you next year. Thank you.